Unbound is the most prestigious and well-known gravel race in the world. Eh, maybe with the exception of the newly added UCI Gravel World Championships, but even with the recent death of the Spirit of Gravel, the UCI and Gravel still has a contentious relationship here in the US. It is certainly the most important race on my calendar and the calendars of many professional gravel racers, and as such I have left no stone unturned in the pursuit of having what I believe is the fastest bike for the Unbound course. Pretty much every part on this bike was picked with optimizing speed over 200 miles of Kansas gravel in mind, and some of these choices are likely not what you were expecting, like mountain bike tires on 60mm deep road wheels, road gearing, a Lauf carbon suspension fork, 140mm stem, 35cm bars. Yes, the bike is a weird mix of optimizing for aerodynamics and rolling resistance on bumpy terrain because that is the challenges that you face with gravel racing. I didn't just haphazardly pick all these parts though. Testing and data including time in the wind tunnel are behind all of these weird equipment choices and I'm going to be sharing that with you today so don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the channel. This video is fueled by the feed. All right, let's not waste any more time and jump straight into this bike build and where better to start than by talking about the frame. The gravel bike I'm racing on this year is Felt's Breed Carbon and at a height of 5 foot 10 or 178 centimeters, I opted for a size 54 frame. As a member of the Felt United team, Felt did these pretty slick custom paint jobs for us that fit with the retro 90s themes for the kits. Or maybe it's 80s. I don't know, it was before my time. The bike is made with aerodynamics in mind by utilizing aero tube shapes, but I already know what the comment section is going to look like because I got about 200 of these comments when I posted the bike on Instagram, and that is... What about those cables, bro? You claim to be all in on marginal gains and you've got freaking exposed cables on your bike? And you know, they'd probably include a barf emoji in there just to really drive the point home. Honestly, I've never seen so many people up in arms about exposed cables than when I posted the picture of this bike, but I guess that's the audience I've cultivated for myself. Hey man, your audience cares about you. I'm telling you right now, there are people watching that genuinely want to see you save 0.4 of a watt so that at your next Grand Prix race, instead of finishing 17th, you can finish, I don't know, 16th. Look, no doubt my preference would be fully internal cables, but I think that if you're gonna run the cables externally, this is actually one of the most aero solutions. Not the prettiest solution, I will grant you that, but one of the most aero ones. Let me explain. On most bikes with exposed cables, the cables bow out in front of the head tube. Not good. However, on this bike, most of the exposed cable is actually hidden behind the handlebar out of the wind. When you actually put a number on the front of your bike on race day, and yes, the Grand Prix is cracking down on correct number placement. Do not bend them, do not fold them, do not cut them, do not tear them, nothing. I want to see them flat on the front of your handlebars, and you could be disqualified. I think you'd be hard pressed to find much if any gain from running the cables internally at that point. I'm sorry I had to waste a decent chunk of this video talking about cables, but if I didn't I was never going to hear the end of it. Let's move on to the most exciting feature of this bike and the reason why I think this particular bike is such a massive advantage for a race like Unbound, and that is the tire clearance. The claimed max tire clearance on this bike is 50 millimeters, which is really good, but you know you can always fit a little bit bigger than they claim, right? Well here on this bike I have mounted a pair of Continental Race King 2.2 mountain bike tires which measure in at 53 millimeters on Reynolds 60 millimeter deep road wheels with a 21 millimeter internal rim width. I will say the fit is tight and I may swap them out if conditions are muddy for more clearance, but they fit without rubbing and on a dry course these will be the tires that I run on race day. Undoubtedly some of you will be shocked to hear that, maybe the some of you that don't regularly watch my videos. So let me break this down for you, this time including some wind tunnel data so I can show you just how much sense this setup actually makes. There are two main factors to consider when choosing a tire for speed in a gravel race, and that is aerodynamics and rolling resistance. I know that other factors exist like puncture resistance and handling, and I will address those in a minute, but for now we're talking strictly about speed. 
Let's start with aerodynamics. Silco was kind enough to invite me back to the ARC wind tunnel this year so that we could get to the bottom of some very important questions. Probably the most notable of which was how much does tire width impact aerodynamics and how much does wheel depth impact aerodynamics when you have a wide tire. As such, we decided to test the Pirelli Cinturato Gravel H tire in the 35, 40, 45, and 50 millimeter width and the Conti Race King 2.2, which as I said, measures in at 53 millimeters. We did this round of testing twice, once on a shallow Reynolds G700 gravel wheel, and once on a 60 millimeter deep Reynolds black label road wheel. The general thought around aero wheels in gravel has been that at a certain point it doesn't help because the tire is simply too wide and the airflow coming off the tire is hardly even making contact with the rim and therefore not helping. Well, these results might surprise you. The first thing to note is that, as expected, tire width makes a difference to aerodynamics. Starting with the 35mm tires on shallow wheels as a baseline, if you were traveling 32 km per hour or 20 miles per hour, which is a good gravel speed and the speed that the pros will probably maintain over the course of the unbound distance, then going up to a 40mm tire would cost you 2.1 watts which would be roughly two minutes and seven seconds slower over the unbound distance. Bump that up to 45 millimeters and we are seeing a four watt penalty over the 35s or four minutes and four seconds slower. Get to 50 millimeters and the penalty is now 5.4 watts or five and a half minutes. So from this initial set, we can recognize a clear trend here. The wider the tire gets, the less aerodynamic it gets, but this is where things get interesting. As you may remember, we tested one more tire, which was the Conti Race King 2.2 mountain bike tire, which is not only wider at 53 millimeters, but it's also much knobbier. So let's see how horrendously that performed in the tunnel. And that's where you and honestly, all of us who were there at the tunnel as well were wrong. The Race King actually performed better than the 50 millimeter Pirelli gravel tire on the shallow rim, only costing 4.9 watts or 4 minutes and 59 seconds over the 35. This is a bit of a revelation for sure, but things get even more interesting when we tested the tires with the 60 millimeter deep Reynolds road wheels. So let's go ahead and look at that data. When you compare tires of the same size on the shallow versus deep wheel, the 35 got 2 watts faster or roughly 2 minutes. The 40s got 1.7 watts faster or a minute and 41 seconds. The 45s got 1.4 watts faster or a minute and 32 seconds. The 50s got 1.7 watts faster or one minute and 41 seconds. And then finally, drum roll please for the Conti Race King somehow coming in at 2.3 watts or two minutes and 17 seconds faster, which again makes the Race King about a watt faster than the 50 millimeter tires and actually puts them right on par, no gain or loss with the 45s. I've got to say, these results were shocking enough that I felt like I needed to ask aero expert and man behind Silka himself, Josh Portner, exactly what his speculation was as to why we were seeing this. You say this every time we go to the wind tunnel, but a lot of times when you go to the wind tunnel, you you leave with more questions than answers. Yeah, always. By a lot, right? And not just by like some. It's like, man, now I have 10 times more questions. Okay, so could you explain to people what the rule of 105 is? Yeah, yeah so originally it was just the idea that your rim width needed to be 105% of your tire width. So you want to let the rim kind of stick out in the airflow either side of the tire to recapture that any air that's separating. So so the reason I set you up for that is because now now we're getting into gravel territory where in most cases the tire is not only wider than the rim but in a lot of cases much wider than the rim. And so that's that's one of the things that we set out to find. We tested different size tires with a deep wheel and a shallow wheel and lo and behold the deep wheel was faster on every width of tire that we tested. So what do you think is going on there? Even with a simple cylinder, you have this sort of like splitter plate effect. You know, you can take a cylinder and just weld like a flat plate um, behind, sticking out behind it. And you'll reduce drag because you're eliminating the, avil the ability of that thing to shed vortices and to get into like an alternating vortex shedding 
sort of a phenomenon. And you will stabilize some of the flow in the void there because you're you're filling it with with something, right? You're not allowing the air to just swirl and tumble and be terrible back there. Um, the rule of 105 is really about you need to follow that if you're going to keep air on the rim in that traditional sense that we tend to think of like a wing, right? That the air is actually flowing over the surface. Um, in this situation, I think what you have is the the rim is just it's just filling up that negative space, giving the air less places to be chaotic and to backflow and to do things like that. The, the other thing um, that we're doing that's pretty important with a deeper rim is you're shortening the spokes. And, you know, I've always joked about, you know, simple like V-shaped rims and things like that. I, in the old days, I used to say like, you know, they're effective spoke shortening devices. So you may not have airflow on them, but you are one, allowing for a geometry that you can have fewer spokes in the wheel. And then two, those spokes are shorter. And so, of course, they're whipping through the air at lower speed at the top of the rim as they're spinning. The shorter the spoke, the slower it's traveling relative to the air as it whips up and through the, the top there. And so, you know, it's having all those effects. It's just in all of this data, we can see that airflow is stalled. It's not that the rim isn't acting really as a effective aerodynamic device by keeping flow attachment or anything. But it's, it's still... You know, and I'm with you. It's, I mean, the results are non-zero. I mean, it's definitely faster. But then we also threw on a Continental Race King 2.2 mountain bike tire, which, and it was almost the exact same as the 45 millimeter Pirelli, which is kind of mind blowing because it's so much wider of a tire and it's got knobs on it. So do you have any theory why that might be? <laughs> I think sometimes you just get lucky, right? I went through this way back in the day with the original GP4000. Like, why was that tire so much faster than anything else? And I, I mean, for a long time, I was convinced the the Continental folks were really onto something. And then I met some of them at uh, Eurobike and they're like, yeah, no, that was, we, we didn't do any testing. It was just luck. A couple interesting things are happening at these in low speed aerodynamics, right? We're, you're at the situation where as the Reynolds number increases, the CD of a lot of these things is is sort of falling. And then as you're adding turbulence or roughness, you might be able to push some of these things out into what they would call like the drag bucket. It's essentially what you know, you're know you trying to do with a golf ball, right? That you have this slowly decreasing Reynolds number and then out here way in space, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but you get this dip that's really unexpected. In low speed aerodynamics, you know the speed of the flow is relatively slow, but as you make them large, the item larger, the Reynolds number will get bigger because there's a length component in there. And then if you add roughness, you can increase artificially the Reynolds number even further. And so, you know, I would say likely what's happening here is there's some sweet spot of the right amount of roughness at the right amount of uh, length of flow. There's essentially the frontal area, uh, but really more the wetted area of, of the thing. And we got lucky. There's some interesting surface texturing on the sidewall of that tire that might might be doing something. But, you know, and this is where like the wind tunnel is just such a, a torment, right, to people who are really trying to figure out the why of things that, you know, you go in there and it's like, yep, here's your data. And like, well, that doesn't make sense. Is it repeatable? Yep, it's repeatable. And like, well, why? Like, yep, not going to tell you. <laughs> and, and so now we got to come up with a ton of speculation as to why that might happen. One extra point on the wheels is that if there is a strong crosswind on race day, I will likely not run these wheels, at least not in the front, and opt for something shallower. However, I will absolutely be using the Race King mountain bike tire in dry conditions this year. 45 millimeters is probably the standard width for most bikes at Unbound at this point, but with no aero advantage, the arguments to use a tire of that width really disintegrate, especially when you consider the other factors. Speaking of, now that we've covered aerodynamics, let's talk about rolling resistance. Surely a 40 millimeter slick is faster than a 2.2 mountain bike tire with knobs, says the painfully uninitiated internet troll. Don't worry, even pros are making the same mistake that you're making right now, so I won't hold it against you. Independent rolling resistance data actually seems to suggest the opposite. Lightweight cross-country mountain bike tires have a lower rolling resistance than their gravel counterparts. This is because mountain bike tires can get away with using a thinner casing without increasing the puncture risk because the volume of the tire is so much higher, and generally a thinner casing means a faster tire. 
Once you factor in that much of the unbound north course is actually done on quite bumpy terrain, then this rolling resistance argument only starts to make more sense. And finally, when you factor in the fact that mitigating puncture risk is probably the most important factor for your unbound tire selection, then there really is no question anymore. These tires were designed for mountain biking, and I have ridden these tires in countless mountain bike races without having puncture issues, so I'm very confident that the risk of puncturing with 2.2 mountain bike tires is lower than with almost any gravel tire I could get, including the ones that have extra puncture protection, which by the way, makes them extra slow as well. At this volume for gravel racing, I don't even run tire inserts because the volume can usually handle any bottom out you throw at it on a gravel course, but I will be running Silka tire sealant because hands down, it's just the sealant that works the best when it comes to actually sealing punctures, which is what a sealant is supposed to do, right? All right, I know I beat the tire and wheel discussion to death at this point, but it's not every day that you see deep section road wheels with honking mountain bike tires on them. It kind of gives off monster truck vibes. Some would say it looks fast, some would say it looks slow. Honestly, I don't care what it looks like as long as it is fast. And that also goes with the next eye-catching feature that I'm about to talk about. I am, of course, talking about that monstrosity of a fork. Ugh. I know you said this bike is built for maximum speed or whatever, but I'm actually starting to think you built it to maximally trigger the internet. For those who are unfamiliar, this is the Lauf Grit 3rd Gen Fork, which is a carbon leaf spring gravel fork with 30 millimeters of travel. And maybe unsurprisingly, people have told me, that thing is not aero, why is it on your bike? If there's one thing that I've learned about aerodynamics from going to a wind tunnel, it's that aerodynamics is not always intuitive. Prepare to have your mind blown. All right, using the stock felt breed carbon gravel fork as a baseline, the Lauf fork was, wait for it, faster. Yes, faster by 1.4 watts or one minute and 23 seconds. Now I know some of you watching may be extremely skeptical right now. You may be wondering if wind tunnels are even accurate or if they're just a conspiracy drummed up by the bike industry to sell you more useless aero garbage that you don't need. I'd be careful, man. You're not gonna have a career as a YouTube industry shill after you're done being a racer industry shill if you keep talking like that. This may be a good time to point out that I'm not affiliated with Lauf in any way. I don't have any sort of code or link, and I don't care if you buy the fork or not. I'm just reporting on some interesting findings. But I get it. The thing does not look like it should be faster, and we could speculate all day as to why or why not, but again, I brought Josh Portner in for that. Well, I mean, all of us did. Even even the guys who, who run the wind tunnel, we were taking bets on how bad the Lauf fork was going to be, and then it was better. I think when you really look at the Lauf, they clearly put some thought into it. I mean, it has a very simple but just known effective kind of a bullet shape. You know, if you were to take a cross section of it, it would just look like the of a medium performance projectile. And it has a very clean cut trailing edge cam tail style. And then everything behind it is exactly that width are slightly narrower and everything is in line. And so I think, you know, the more I look at it, it's like, okay, they, they maybe didn't design for this or test for this, but I, I can almost guarantee someone along the way was thinking about it and thought, you know, we should, we should just put that in there. And, um, yeah, it's extremely effective. Some forks have been getting wider. I've heard different theories. Some of the theories involve tripping the air before it hits your leg. Some of the theories involve the air being whipped up from the tire is not interfering with the air coming through the fork. And if you look at the Lauf fork, it's significantly wider and has more tire clearance than the felt fork does. Do you think there's anything to that? Possibly. You know, I think it's it's not really wide enough to work like we see a lot of these Olympic track bikes, right? Where you're trying to get the things out kind of so that they're essentially wind shadowing or, or you know, directly in front of or directly behind, say, the rider's legs. And so it's not quite wide enough to be doing that. But we do know that with the interference between the really the rim, uh, particularly on a deeper rim and the fork blade, that y you need some breathing space in there. Uh, you really want to, you know, you get these the wheel is carrying a boundary layer with it forward through the fork blades. And so if things start to get too close, you're sometimes you find the fork is directing air into that boundary layer um, and you get these forward tumbles. And like, if you put smoke on it, you'll actually see that the, the smoke is like coming forward through the fork legs. Um, 
rather than going cleanly through. And, and by making things a little bit wider, you, my imagination or imaginings would be that they've just picked a better cross-section than our baseline 4 CAD. We talk a lot about the CDA components, right? So we had lower CD and not really much more A. And so the net was a reduction. What I will say about this fork is that not only is it supposedly more aero than the stock fork, but also it genuinely feels good to ride on bumpy gravel. The 30 millimeters of travel takes the sting out of the rough surface. And just like with the tires, the bump absorption is actually improving speed on bumpy terrain. A bike that is jackhammering down the road that you can feel every tiny crack and divot through the frame on may feel fast, but those vibrations are actually slowing you down. This fork is also not much heavier at 850 grams, which is only about 200 to 250 grams heavier than most stock gravel forks. The one downside for sure is the absence of a lockout. One could argue how much that really matters, especially on the front, but you do notice the bobbing when you get out of the saddle, especially on pavement. But there's not a lot of pavement at Unbound, so for obvious reasons, it will be on my bike for the race. The next bit that I know some of you are scratching your head at is that ridiculously long dong stem paired with the narrow bars. That's right, this is a full-on aero road-style cockpit on a gravel bike with a 140mm NV aero stem set in the negative 17 degree position with no spacers underneath, or on top for that matter, paired with NV's aero bar, which is 35 centimeters at the hoods and 40 centimeters at the drops. Now given that Unbound is not a very technical gravel course, bumpy, sure, but technical, not so much, you may be asking yourself, Dylan, if narrow is aero, then why stop at 35 millimeters? The answer is, we actually tested it. For this test, we tested Envy's aero handlebar at 35 centimeters, an aero coach bar at 32 centimeters, and then we went really extreme and tested a toot engineering track racing bar, which was just 26 centimeters wide. The toot engineering bar is basically completely impractical for actual gravel racing, but we did want to see how much savings we could get by going very extreme. What would be more interesting is whether or not going to the more usable 32 centimeter bar would offer further aero gains, and surprisingly, it didn't. The 32 centimeter aero coach bars were actually 2.6 watts or 2 minutes and 38 seconds slower. And again, Josh Portner has thoughts on that. And this is from Silka's own video about the wind tunnel on their channel, which is linked below. And I recommend you check it out. We were a little confused at the time until we got the frontal view of this. And the particular bar he had had a little bit of a, of a camber to the hoods this way. And it actually took him from more of a vertical upper arm position to more of what we would call like the chicken wing position. And so the hands got narrower, but the elbows actually came out with that particular bar because of that flare that uh, in the geometry of the bar. And he actually got a lot worse. So, you know, you guys know, I love to say it depends. This is one of those, are narrow bars better? Well, it depends. If your elbows come out, uh, then they're not. Back to the test though, those insanely narrow track bars were in fact faster by quite a bit at 4.9 watts or 4 minutes and 50 seconds. This isn't too surprising as I was essentially in an aero bar position with those bars, but again, pretty impractical for actual gravel racing in a pack. And if I'm really trying to get aero, I'll probably just do the puppy paws position on the Envy bars that I'll be running, which is still legal at Unbound. The UCI hasn't gotten their grubby little hands or their rule book on this one yet. And speaking of puppy paws, to make it easier, I've put rubber grip tape on the top of the bars to prevent slipping. The brand is Cat Tongue, by the way, if you want to try it out for yourself. It works pretty well. I give it a thumbs up. There were some other aftermarket aero products that we tried that you might think would be worth it and certainly have bold marketing claims, but after testing, I ended up scrapping them. These included things like aero rotors and aero chainring covers. The aero rotors only saved 0.2 of a watt, and given that the braking and cooling performance isn't as good, that one was a no for me. And then the aero chainring cover was actually slower by 0.6 of a watt, probably because it was increasing the area or A in the CDA equation. Interestingly enough though, adding a camera to the front of my bike in the form of the tiny 25 gram Instago Go 2 camera actually made my bike faster by a tiny amount at 1.6 watts or a minute and 35 seconds. 
As a race content creator who also has marginal gains OCD, I'm sure you can imagine I was pretty relieved about that one. I don't know what I would have done if that one had come back slower. Another nice feature of this bike, particularly for a race like Unbound, is the ability to fit four bottles in the frame. Three in the main triangle and then one under the down tube. If it's hot at Unbound this year, all four of these bottle cages will be in use. And the cages I use are Silka tie cages, which come in this beautiful unicorn colorway, which just so happens to match the paint scheme of the bike quite well. Having all three bottle cages filled is a bit slower by 1.8 watts, but there's not even a question whether that's worth it for a hot year at Unbound. And maybe if I want to get really crazy, I'll stuff a bottle down the front of my jersey, which was a shocking... 5.1 watts or just over five minutes faster. I know this is putting me in the precarious predicament of looking like a triathlete, but those watts savings are seriously tempting and more water is never a bad thing at Unbound. So it's kind of a win-win if you don't mind looking a bit ridiculous. We do mind. Please just stop before this gets out of hand. Moving on, let's talk about the drivetrain because there's a lot going on here to try to improve its efficiency. First of all, I run Shimano GRX 11 speed, mainly because as you may remember from this video, Shimano chains are a bit more efficient than SRAM chains, especially the 11 speed ones. To further improve efficiency, I've upgraded to ceramic speed oversized pulley wheels, ceramic speed bottom bracket, and ceramic speed bearings in the wheels. The cassette is an 11 to 34 tooth, and the chain rings are Shimano Ultegra 52 tooth and 36 tooth, which if you are familiar with gravel is quite large. Most gravel racers are going with a 48 or a 50 tooth big chain ring, but just like has been the trend in road racing recently, I'm going even bigger to try to further improve the efficiency of the drivetrain. The bigger rings allow me to stay more in the middle of the cassette improving the chain line, and the chain doesn't have to articulate as much around the larger rings. And quite honestly, there's nothing steep enough at Unbound that standard road gearing is ever an issue. In fact, I'd probably be more worried about spinning out on the top end. You may have noticed that this is a SRAM red crank with Shimano rings, and the reason why that works is because they fit together with a Quark D4 power meter, which is designed for Shimano chain rings. The red crank upgrade is simply to save a bit of weight over the stock cork crank that comes with this power meter, and I have switched to 165mm cranks this year, and I don't plan on switching back anytime soon. I mainly did it to avoid knee pain during really big training blocks, and the theory behind it is that your knee goes through less of a range of motion with each pedal stroke, therefore decreasing the likelihood that you're going to experience knee pain, and knock on wood, I haven't experienced knee pain yet this season. It also makes getting in an aero position a bit easier as there's less hip impingement at the top of the stroke. Given that I haven't noticed any drop off in power with them, I'd say it's a win-win. To wrap things up, for pedals my preference is Shimano Dura-Ace road pedals for a dry course, but obviously if it's muddy I will switch to mountain bike pedals. The seat post is from Envy and the saddle is a 3D printed Specialized S-Works Roman. It's pretty damn comfortable, which is obviously important if you're going to spend over 10 hours on it. To finish up the touch points, I've got Silka bar tape and the head unit that I will use for this race is the Wahoo Element Roam. I prefer the bigger display of the Roam over the Bolt, especially for a race like Unbound where you need the navigation on, and a bigger computer is actually easier to grab onto in the puppy paws position and kind of act as a makeshift arrow bar. That's the nitty gritty on this bike. I appreciate you tuning in, and if you want to get more updates on my bike builds and my racing, be sure to check me out on Instagram. I also have online coaching and training plans linked down in the description below. And finally, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like, subscribe, and share it with your cycling friends. I'll see you in the next one.